Welcome, Welcome to, to CSIS, CSIS Online. Online. The way, the way we bring you events is changing, changing but, but we'll still, we'll still present, present live analysis and award-winning digital, digital media from our Tracopolis Ideas Lab. Lab. All, All on your time, time live, live or, or on, on demand. demand. This, this is CSIS, CSIS Online. Online. Hello and welcome to today's discussion about the military and pandemics. We'll take a look at early lessons learned from the three months of fighting the pandemic, and then we'll consider what these lessons might mean for the future structure and missions of the armed forces. I'm Mark Cancy, I'm a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. This event is made possible by general support from CSIS, and we express our appreciation to the center's many partners who make that uh, support possible. I'm joined today by a knowledgeable group of panelists, David Barno, Nora Bensahel, and Melanie Marlowe. David Barno is a visiting professor of strategic studies and senior fellow at the Merrill Center at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. In addition to teaching, he writes frequently on national security topics, particularly as contributing editor and columnist for War on the Rocks. A retired Army Lieutenant General, he served 30 years on active duty where he commanded at every level and commanded coalition forces in Afghanistan from 2003 to 2005. A graduate of West Point, General Barno earned his master's degree in national security studies from Georgetown University. Nora Benzahel is also a visiting professor of strategic studies and a senior fellow at SICE and a contributing editor and columnist at War on the Rocks. Before arriving at SICE, he was a senior political scientist at RAND and a deputy director of studies at the Center for New American Security. Dr. Benzahel received her PhD and master's degrees from the Department of Political Science at Stanford University and her BA magna cum laude from Cornell University. I would note that David and Nora have a book coming out shortly, Adaptation Under Fire, How Militaries Change in Wartime. It will be published by Oxford on September 1st, so you can watch for that. Melanie Marlowe is a senior non-resident fellow, uh, associate rather, at CSIS. She writes on American politics and is currently editing a volume on national security law and policy. A native of Idaho, she received her bachelor's degree in political science from Utah State University and a master's degree from Claremont Graduate University, where she's completing a dissertation on executive war powers. She is currently a lecturer at Georgetown University, where she teaches national security law. She's also a senior editor at War on the Rocks, a co-host of the National Assessment, uh, the Net Assessment podcast, and a principal of M3 Consulting. Thank you all for joining us today. The format today will be as follows. I'll give each of the panelists a few minutes to talk about their views and perspectives. And then as the moderator, I'll ask them some questions that I have and that have arisen from their presentations. Finally, we'll have a question and answer period uh, from our online audience. Uh, to send in a question, click the link on your screen and submit your question along with your name and affiliation. Uh, you may submit questions at any time. Our staff uh, will collect those and forward them. So with that as an introduction, let me turn to Mel Melanie for our first uh, discussion. Great, thanks, Mark. It's really great to be here. I'm happy to be on the panel with two people, three people that I admire <laughs> and that I've, I've long read their work. I've been thinking about this and national security and COVID is sort of a generalist. Uh, I don't, I'm not a specialist in the way that um, other people may be, and I haven't served in the military, so I don't have that kind of perspective. But I do have the perspective of someone who thinks about this and, and, and reads and is um, concerned about our national security overall. In January, we were starting to think about this. We were getting news and we were hearing about, you know, this disease that was going on, but we didn't have a lot of information. Not a lot of guidance was going on. And uh, at the end of February, I went to London. And before I went to London, I went to Walgreens because I was starting to worry about, do I need a mask? And I walked into the Walgreens and they were going to sell me a pack of 50 masks for $12. And I thought, why would I ever need 50 masks? This is ridiculous. I'm not going to spend money on, on that. And I don't want to be one of those people that thinks that she has to have a mask when we're getting all of this guidance not to have a mask. So we really didn't know what was going on. But by the time I was coming home from London, I was frankly worried I wasn't going to be able to get on a flight. Um, the seriousness was being understood in briefing rooms and government offices and, and offices around the world 
but there was a lot of confusion still on the ground. And the United States was caught flat-footed and very unprepared. But by the time the government was going into action, we moved into the act action with the help of the military. And for that, I am very grateful. We had thousands of active duty supporting us and over 40,000 um, National Guard troops. The Army set up field hospitals. The Navy sent the ships. The Air Force was moving cargo, evacuating American citizens from other countries, um, moving PPE. And, and that was just so helpful. The DOD accumulated masks and our research lab started working on vaccines. We were very fortunate um, and have been very fortunate that the worst models did not come to pass. But I think that today we're going to hit 115,000 American deaths. And every one of those deaths is a tragedy. So again, um, it was an amazing effort uh, that was really spurred by the military. We were very fortunate to have them. And they deserve the praise and the respect and um, the strong sentiments that we see in poll after poll about uh, American approval of the military as a whole. Now, in spite of that, <laughs> in my view, I think that we should move away from dependence on the military for things like pandemics. Um, in my view, we have a tendency towards militarizing things when we could be using other instruments to, or entities to achieve our goals. And I think that that's visible here. This was a great crisis, uh, the biggest since World War II. Um, the entire nation was affected in some way. Geographically, it was widespread. It wasn't the 9-11 the attacks were tragic, but they were concentrated in certain places. This was something that had enormous impact in economics and health uh, for, for every American. And in my view, um, health and the health of American citizens and including the military is a national security issue. There is some debate about that. So it's my aversion to the military working on this isn't because I don't think it's a national security problem. It's a grave national security problem. We had a stop movement order for troops that, and their families that were going from one assignment to the next. And I presume the military had reasons for them to be going from one place to the next. And unfortunately, that was lifted, I believe, on Monday, a few weeks uh, earlier than we thought it might have been. But for a couple of months, that was a real restriction and, and you know, cause, cause problems. Um, we can't do everything from home. There's a lot we can do from home and a month or so into uh, the social distancing orders and the work from home orders, DOD did put out the word that things were moving along and they'd had more people online and able to function. But you can't do a lot of, you can do some engineering from home, you can do some construction from home, but you can't do all of that from home. And then just the interpersonal relationships and the kinds of conversations that take place those, um, you know, understanding people's body language when you're making weighty decisions, that's a real problem uh, to, to not be able to do that. And then our personnel get sick and die. We had the Theodore Roosevelt and we learned from that. Unfortunately, when we had other similar circumstances, um, by the time it came to the kid, we made some, or people there made some responsible choices. But there was great public vulnerability, and that was on display for the entire world. And the damage that was done to the health of the sailors and, frankly, to um, our public reputation, I would consider that a national security threat as well. And then something that I think that we'll probably spend more um, unhappy time on, perhaps, is the, the budgets. Uh, we spend a lot of money on the military. We spend three quarters of a trillion dollars on our military. And um, that is going to go down. Now, maybe it should be decreased, but we're going to have to make choices that maybe we didn't anticipate um, sooner than we, th than we wanted to. And the pressure on budgets is going to, and on national security is going to be evident uh, for many years. So I would ask, is the military required um, probably, probably not. And in my view, we could do this even better with civilians. There's not a lot of slack in the military healthcare delivery system. It's not easily transferable to large populations over large geographical spaces for long periods of time. So it would take some planning and it would take some thinking, but I think it's possible for us to come up with a different system. The National Commission on Public Service uh, issued a report a few months ago um, it was supposed to come out with great fanfare, and unfortunately, it, 
came out just when COVID was getting underway. I think that there's going to have a bigger kickoff in a couple of weeks. But they suggest, you know, the individual ready reserve, having people around the country who would be willing to pick up and leave their civilian jobs or maybe people who retired or who retired early. Um, where, where they would be able to go do that. I've, I've got a sister who was a nurse and she, her youngest kid is in eighth grade and um, she is looking at going back and, and maybe doing some things, she would be great. But the, the pressure that's put on, for example, the guard, they leave jobs that are presumably important jobs as well. And they sign up for this and they're willing to go and do that. And it's not about their willingness or capability, but I have a brother-in-law in, in the, uh, Air National Guard, and he runs a state hospital for uh, disabled individuals. And he was deployed to Afghanistan, and he loved every minute of it. And he's willing to do those things. But in a real health crisis, a lot of the people who would be called up, they would be leaving jobs that would um, put other people in very vulnerable situations. And then, so I, I think that... Um, it, it might hurt the military in terms of their readiness. I think that it could be better done by civilians. And then I also am concerned about the civil military relations aspect of it. Again, I believe that the military has acquitted itself so well uh, during COVID. And I would even argue um, very well in the last couple of weeks, we're, we're talking about this um, with the background of the protests. Um, and they've been, um, models of respectability in, in most uh, instances. But the constant use of troops, the using them for possibly health reasons um, and, and helping the population in one way, and then possibly you know coming to dispel riots or disperse individuals, um, the threat that they might get used more frequently for political purposes, um, we saw all the briefings with President Trump and his team, and the aura of confidence that they present was demanding and commanding. And I think that it gave a lot of people um, hope that we were going to be able to get through this. But I also worry about them being a cover for accountability and um, responsible for perhaps bad decisions that, that they don't make. So with that, I will toss it off to, I believe, Nora. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks very much, Mark, for the invitation to be here today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you uh, on this really important subject. I want to start my remarks by saying that the pandemic is the greatest catastrophe to befall the nation in decades, if not more than a century. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that. We're living through it. Um, but if you go back and look at what this country is going through now, it combines the elements of the pandemic of 1918 to 19 with the economic crisis that was precipitated in the 1929 stock market crash and then the years of the Great Depression. We're demanding more sacrifice at home than we have since World War II on the home front, even though, of course, the overseas fighting part of that is not uh, present. Uh, and then in the last couple of weeks, we've also added an element of 1968 to that mix with the protests about, you know, civil rights and uh, freedom of assembly that are, uh, you know, very pressing, crucial national issues. So we are just at the beginning of understanding what the implications of this tremendous, tremendous change uh, and this real uh, genuine national catastrophe. We're just at the beginning of being able to sort through what, we, what that means and, and you know, for our purposes, what that means for, for national security. But we know we're not gonna be the same as we were before. Um, and I think that there are two really big important ways in which national security will not be the same as it was before. And then I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague and writing partner, uh, General Barno, to talk about some of the sp more specific implications for the Department of Defense. But I think the biggest change will be how Americans, most Americans, will see national security. For most of US history, National security has been defined as threats that emanate from outside the United States. We focus on nation states, uh, you know, countries that have the ability to make war against us. Uh, arguably, since September 11th, we've taken the threat of non-state actors more seriously, but they have all had or overseas origins. 
Homeland security is something that uh, we didn't really talk about much before September 11th. And even since then, we've put that in a separate department, the Department of Homeland Security, and still maintained this distinction between national security focuses on external threats. That's what the Department of Defense does. Homeland security, something else. Well, now, because of the enormous toll that this is taking on the nation, most Americans, when they think about security, they're not going to be thinking about external security nearly as much as they were before. In fact, many U.S. citizens haven't thought about it that way. They're going to think more and more, more and more Americans are going to be thinking about their own personal security and what that means, whether that's from a virus uh, like this, which is, uh, you know, as, as Melanie said, the statistics uh, are going to hit 115,000 and those are only going up. We are not uh, nearly done with the waves of this pandemic that are going to happen until there's a vaccine or herd immunity kicks in. And even though hopefully we won't all be trapped in our homes for that period of time, we're going to be managing this for months and months, if not years to come. Um, that number, by the way, I think it's really important. It puts it in terms that most national security analysts can understand. Uh, that is already significantly more than the total of all U.S. service members that have been uh, that have died in action since the end of World War II. If you combine Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, the Gulf War, and the recent wars, you get a total that's just slightly above 100,000 people uh, who died in wars overseas. So even in the extent of the casualties this has produced, we've lost more Americans in the past three months than we have in all overseas military operations since World War II combined. So Americans are going to be looking at what their personal security involves, whether that's a future virus or whether that's something else. And I think they're going to ask legitimate questions about what the $750 billion that the United States spends on national security every year did to protect them and did to help them. Um, I'm going to disagree actually a bit with what uh, Melanie said here. The military response, the contribution to this response was truly minimal. And it should be minimal. That's what we want. We don't want this to be a military response. That's no disrespect to the almost 40,000 National Guard troops that were called up uh, to deal uh, with the pandemic. Those who were dealing with the protests were another 17,000, separate issue uh, in terms, but you know, more than 40,000 uh, uh, Guard and Reservists called up to deal specifically with the pandemic. Um, but then, you know, providing support to civil authorities is not what we pay the vast majority of our expenses towards. We pay the most money to keep troops on active duty because we have to pay them all the time to be ready in case there is a, an existential threat from abroad to the nation. So, you know, the, the reserve component and the Guard in particular did play a very notable role in the response. Their responses were incredibly important. I don't want to undermine those. Uh, but, you know, $750 billion invested in that didn't get you a whole lot of pandemic response. And at a time when Americans are going to be thinking more and more about their own vulnerabilities, I'm not sure that kind of spending is going to be politically sustainable, even if it might not have been for other reasons. In this new, uh, you know, current ongoing pandemic or post-pandemic world, I think that's going to be a very, very tough sell uh, indeed. Then you add on top of that the economic costs of the recovery, right? We've already borrowed almost $4 trillion this year, adding to the national debt very significantly. Tax revenue is going to go down significantly because of the, the stoppage of most businesses. Um, you know, spending on emergency preparedness and resilience in the civilian sector is going to have to go up as a result of this. And my own view is that we're actually going to see much more of a national debate than we might have otherwise about uh, expanding the social safety net, even if it's just in ways that, uh, you know, seem somewhat limited, but, you know, providing some amount of paid leave for workers in case, you know, to encourage them to stay home. That would have been politically extremely controversial before the pandemic. I don't think that's going to be as controversial. I don't think it's going to sail through. But I think, you know, the understanding that we need to do more uh, for domestic preparedness, even in those ways, is already going to be very expensive at a time when uh, the budget is going to be under great pressure. And most Americans, as I said, are going to be wondering why we're spending $750 billion on defense while remaining unprepared in some other areas. So all this means that the defense budget is going to go down. The defense budget is probably going to go down by a lot 
My own view is that we're going to be in a period of defense cuts that makes the sequestration era look easy by comparison. That'll probably take a couple of years before it kicks in, given the long lead time that it takes in preparing the defense budget. Um, but this is not the defense budget scenario that uh, uh, any of the current leaders of the military, military or civilian, uh, would have envisaged. And that's going to require some incredibly uh, tough choices. Um, I'll turn it now over to, uh, to my colleague, General Barno, to talk a bit more specifically about how that changing definition of national security, focusing much more inward, um, and uh, what, you know, what the declining national uh, defense budget is going to uh, require in terms of trade-offs. Well, thanks, Dr. Benzel. And uh, Mark, thanks uh, again for giving us this opportunity to uh, talk on a incredibly important subject, some, some of which has been uh, buried by current events in the last two weeks, but one that's going to resurrect itself very soon, I think, is uh, perhaps the uh, most critical, most demanding of the scenarios that we're going to see in the months and years ahead. I, I would uh, double down on uh, Dr. Benzel's point about this is a unique period, and I think we underestimate that at our peril, that we are now in a window, which I would describe as a trifecta of problems between the very rapid onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in the, in, the, in the country and around the world, and the, the uh, immense, really unprecedented disruptive effects that's had on every corner of our society. Uh, adding to that the economic distress that has come with it by shutting down the nation and you know putting tens of millions of Americans and others around the world out of work and really disrupting the entire economy. And then, in a sense, now adding to that, the, the social unrest and the protests and the other challenges that we're facing here in this country in particular, this is a fairly striking period of time and it doesn't align itself well with precedent as we look back across history. I think we will, we will see this as a watershed event, a before and after event. And we're, when we enter into the after, it's gonna be a different after, especially for the United States military. That's kind of the point of our, our discussion here today. So I would build on some of uh, Dr. Benzel's points and talk a bit about how uh, I see the military shifting directions and priorities in the aftermath of COVID-19. And the reasons for this, you know, I think she laid out well, which was we're going to see a very different budgetary environment. We're gonna see a nation that's dealing with staggering amounts of debt and annual deficits that we've not seen the likes of since World War II. We're going to see a nation where the people are less convinced that you know three quarters of a trillion dollars per year on the U.S. military actually buys them the protection that they need for their own personal security. And so the whole notion of what security is, I think, in this environment is going to be different in the aftermath of COVID-19. I, I would argue that uh, our priorities in some ways are going to shift in the U.S. military from a focus externally on how to protect Americans in a sense, playing the away game to how to protect Americans here at home. And I think within that, the domains of cyberspace and of space itself are going to be much higher priorities in the coming years than they've been in the past and perhaps supersede the importance of air, land, and sea domains as the U.S. thinks about its overall national security and defense. One of the things that the pandemic has taught us is that we live in a world where those traditional defense barriers that we put up around the world for deployed naval forces or army troops stationed in Europe or air power at various bases around the world have, have no ability to prevent Americans from being struck right here at home. In this particular case, that was the pandemic that transcended all of those physical defense barriers because it was a biological threat that we didn't have any type of real serious barriers to prevent but that could have easily have been a massive cyber attack. It could have been an attack taking down our space assets, all of which could have had catastrophic effects here at home, again, without encountering the U.S. Navy in the Western Pacific or the U.S. Army in Central Europe or the Marines in the Southwest Pacific. Those forces would have been irrelevant to attack of a large scale in the cyber domain or in the space domain. So I think there's going to be a reckoning that says we are very vulnerable over here at home that we really didn't realize and our military hasn't been built to accommodate. So I think we're going to see a significant shift in resourcing and priorities accorded to those domains that aren't particularly tied to geographic barriers the way that the air, land, and sea domain are. In, in concert with that, I think our long-running, you know, really 70-year strategy of reliance on forward defense around the world is going to diminish significantly. 
Uh, we've already seen the U.S. beginning to pull its military forces out of the Middle East. That's been an ongoing effort. I think that's going to continue. I suspect we'll see forces out of Afghanistan soon. The president announced this week a unexpected cut of one third of U.S. forces in, in Germany uh, with no consultation with allies and very little consultation with the Pentagon, as best we can determine. I think that trend towards moving forces back in away from the, these four defenses is only going to accelerate. That's a very expensive investment in our forces. And, and unfortunately, what we have now found is that we don't have the ability by deploying military forces around the world to actually protect the very vulnerable homeland here in the United States. It, that those defenses, while important and may may be important, especially to prevent aggression by you know bad actors in various parts of the world, whether it's an aggressive Chinese stance in the South China Sea or Russian adventurers in Europe, they can't protect against these threats that leap across these geographic barriers and strike Americans right here at home. And again, pan, the pandemic is kind of a wake up call of all wake up calls to, to drive that home here in the United States. We also think that the reserve component in the aftermath of this crisis is going to have a much, much bigger role and a more important role. Uh, it has the great value of being a dual purpose force, as we've seen to a limited extent here during COVID-19. The Air National Guard, Army National Guard, the reserve components of the various services have been responsible for buttressing some of our medical support, but also being able to secure areas that needed to be cordoned off, to be able to provide food distribution in other areas, to be able to assist in augmenting civilian medical capacity. Uh, a whole diversity of different tasks, you know, in, in a sense, the, the reserve component forces, the National Guard and the reserves of the services have been a Swiss army knife that have been able to be used by governors in particular, in the case of the Guard, in all sorts of different contingencies to meet needs that were greater than what could be accomplished with their standing forces of police, or rescue and, and, and other uh, support forces in, in, in their states and in their communities. That's an incredible capability that the active force is not really designed to do. The Guard is also a significant value for the dollar relative to the active forces. In the last 20 years, the active duty military pay and benefits for individual active service members have gone up 64% uh, discounting inflation. Those costs don't accrue in the same way for the National Guard and the reserves. And in effect, you're getting a lot more bang for your buck. Not only are they cheaper to maintain over the long haul, but they also have this dual purpose capability, particularly for the guard at the state level that the active forces simply don't provide. And then as the homeland becomes a more important area that Americans are concerned with their protection in, that they have fewer defenses in the active forces, we think the reserve component will be a very important contributor to that. Also would build on the point uh, Dr. Benzel made about budget cuts and the impact of those on the force. Um, there's almost no question the defense budget is going to go down in the coming years. We think there's probably two big areas that that's going to have an effect on. First is end strength. You know, because of those immense costs of active duty forces, there's a very high probability that we're going to see the active duty end strengths of the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force drop uh, because of so, so much savings that can be accrued by cutting numbers of people on active duty. Those may be disproportionate. They may not be simply, you know, each of these services takes a 5% or a 10% cut, and they may be targeted to what forces are the most likely to be employed and the most uh, capable in the future. So it's not clear how that will, will play out, but I think in particular, the services such as the Army and the Marines, they rely on large numbers of people for their force structure. The Army in particular, are going to be on the bullseye for some significant end strength cuts to be able to reap some savings that can't be found in big programs. At the same time, I would say that some of the large legacy programs the United States has been investing in for decades are, are going to be on the cut block, either to be reduced significantly or perhaps to be, you know, abrogated and stopped entirely. You know, the U.S. is now buying an F-35 fighter fleet that's got an entire life cycle cost of over a trillion dollars, 2,400 fighters. It's buying large uh, new carriers in the Ford class of carriers whose survivability in, in a major war with a power such as China is questionable. And there's a number of other large, big legacy programs that are at the top of their technology curve for systems that have been around for 50, 60, 70, 100 years that are inordinately expensive within the defense budget. I think a number of those are going to be on the on the cut block, and we're going to see the opportunity within that too to perhaps reshape the Defense Department 
to focus on a different type of warfare than simply, you know, the heavy reliance on heavy iron, as I would put it, you know, tanks, aircraft, manned aircraft, and, and large ships out there that are very vulnerable in the world that we're in right now. So there, this is going to be a major shakeup for DOD in terms of not only how it spends its money, how much money it has, but what it invests in in terms of how it's going to fight in the future. I'd also say that uh, one of the things that is a possible spinoff of this crisis as well is that because of the role of the U.S. military in this crisis, and perhaps exacerbated by you know the last few weeks, that the prestige of the U.S. military is you know the iconic element of U.S. society that's been really put on a pedestal since 9/11 may diminish a bit. That Americans are going to look around their neighborhoods and see that there are other heroes out there that are putting their lives at risk every day in the COVID-19 crisis. And it's not simply people wearing camouflage uniforms in the military uh, that are the, the heroes that are protecting the nation from these threats. So this is going to change perceptions a bit of U.S. military. Perhaps, again, events of the last uh, two weeks or so may also influence that. But I think in some ways that uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19, you're going to see some dimming of military prestige which has been at its apex really since 9-11. That's going to be a, a different world for the U.S. military to recruit in, to be able to retain their people in, uh, to be able to make sure they keep high quality standards in, in the force, that all volunteer force that's been so successful out there. So again, to, to sum up, I'd say this is a watershed event for the nation, but it's also going to be a watershed event for the U.S. military and that the military that the nation wants and expects and builds in the aftermath of this crisis may not look exactly like the military that we thought we were going to build and construct and shape going into it. There's some major, major changes afoot here. And I think the military is going to have to be very farsighted and think about how to leverage this crisis to make sure that the military that comes out of it is the strongest one possible for a different world than the one it, it started out in. So with that, let me turn it back over to uh, Mark Hansen. Well, thanks a lot. Um, that raises a lot of interesting questions. Let me start with the, the big one, the stepping back. What should be DOD's role when faced with a crisis like the pandemic? Should the military lead? Should it co-lead? Or should it mainly just provide support to civilian agencies? I think Melanie was in the sort of in the last category. Um, uh, but many others have proposed either that uh, DOD be a, a co-lead. And then even when this crisis began, you heard many voices saying, where is the military? You know, send in the military. We need the military to come in and save us. So uh, where, what do you think that the military's role should be? And uh, just to build on that, remember in the beginning of the crisis, Secretary Esper was trying to tamp down expectations about what the military was going to do, you know, saying they wanted support, but, you know, they were not in the lead. And he took a lot of criticism for that, that the military was not stepping up to the responsibilities that it had to protect the nation. So where do you come out? Uh, and well, let me, I'll, I'll let Melanie start, but I, I think I, should, I know where she is, and then we'll go around. Yeah, there's a lot that I agree with that that was just said, for example, I think we are going to have to have a huge national conversation about what our priorities are. And there is no doubt, uh, David said, there's almost no question that the budget's going to get slashed. There is no question that there are going to be these long-term um, budget cuts. And I'm not even necessarily opposed to going through, I'm, I'm not opposed to going through the budget with a fine tune comb and everybody's going to have to do that. And we're going to have to look for money. Um, when it comes to specifically what Mark was just asking about, Again, my concern is, especially when we have a more limited force, and I'm very happy to have one that is paying a lot more attention to cyber and space, because by taking out satellites, by a, a cyber attack, you could kill a lot of people in hospitals, you could kill, you know, mess with a lot of people's personal information, but you could have an economic disaster on the level that we, ha we have right now. Um, so... So those things are fine. My concern is that we'll take the eyes off the military, getting good at doing those things and better at doing those things and having them take care of things that might be better done through um, not maybe FEMA, but a FEMA type organization that can deal with the logistics, even if it's just the beginning, you know, or, or getting things going, getting things underway and then having, um, you know, as things develop and we understand what more of the situation is, assigning it to where it, it properly belongs. My concern is that with, uh, the, the COVID crisis with, I believe that the military is going to start taking a more active role on climate change issues, that they're going to be doing important things, but things that might uh, 
divert from the mission that that I want the military to have. I know that you said it's going to look like a very different military. And, and I think that even in some respects that's true. So I'm wondering if those are things that would go under, wh why do they go under the department of defense and not, and why, why don't we get other organizations good at doing logistics and collecting things and being prepared for these kinds of emergencies? Yeah, I'll jump in next. I, look, I think that the role of the, the military played in the response to the crisis was just about right. Um, we don't want the military to be in charge of these kinds of things. That goes against uh, everything that we hold about the role of the appropriate military in role of the military in U.S. society. Something we've been debating over the last couple of weeks in a very different context. Um, it makes sense that the National Guard of all of the forces in the U.S. military was at the forefront of the response, again, because as Dave mentioned, they, by design, report most of the time to state governors and are used in a state capacity, though they can be federalized for overseas operations and also sometimes to help a federal response at home if that is deemed necessary. But we don't want the military focusing on this, not just because of the issue of they already have a pretty large mission to do in staying prepared to defend us against possible external threats, um, but because that's not the role that, that the Constitution assigns, that, that you know, generations of Americans have decided they want the military to play in society. Again, that leaves the active component as the most vulnerable, though, you know, to, to expand on a point that General Barno made earlier, precisely because the active component is much more expensive. The reserve forces cost uh, as much when they're activated, but because they're activated uh, only some of the time, they're less expensive overall. And they have this dual capacity in order to be able to respond to uh, uh, governor's orders and to support civil authorities in the state role, as well as in the federal role of supporting civil authorities. So, you know, that... I don't think that there's really much debate about what role the military should be playing. I think when you heard those calls early on, it was about frustration about the national response, but there wasn't a whole lot more that the military would have been able to bring to the table other than the logistical transportation and in some cases, some uh, public security functions that it provided. And I think we would revise that at our peril, again, not just for what the military's other mission is, but for what we conceive of, of the role of the military in our democratic society. Yeah, I would add to that. I agree with uh, both of those sets of comments. I think the military should play a supporting role in these type of endeavors, especially one that's outside of its broadest range of expertise here in a pandemic. Uh, and I think the military's role has generally been about right. A lot of it under state control under the governors to the National Guard, not you know federalized and with direction from Washington, D.C. I don't even think the military should play a co-lead role in these type of efforts, although there have been elements of, for example, the vaccine hunt is being uh, co-led by an army four-star general who's the chief logistician of the army. That's, that's, if you need that, that's okay, but I don't think that's an area the military ought to be more involved with than they are right now. What, what this also tells us, though, is that there, you know, my personal opinion is that we have an intense uh, underperformance uh, of American institutions. Our, our institutions right now, our capabilities are very weak across the U.S. government relative to the U.S. military. And one could argue, and some do, particularly in the State Department, that's because the Department of Defense gets $750 billion a year and is the largest organization on the face of the earth. But all of the institutions I can think of, to include those that are designed to deal with this kind of a crisis, the CDC comes to mind, have not been up to the task, are not, are not, have not proven themselves to be strong players, partly because they're not funded well, partly because they've been you know, subsumed by other organizations or out, outflanked in a sense by the military and its capabilities. Think of this in the world of diplomacy overseas. Bob Gates has just written on that. So we, we've got to find a way to empower our institutions that are important and ensure that they get the quality people and the kind of budgets and the kind of leadership they need to be able to take on the roles in these crises so that the military isn't the first go-to for the American people for anything that happens under the sun. That, that's a very problematic development. It's only gotten worse in the last several decades. Great. Uh, I'm going to put on my defense analysis hat here, coming from my experience in CAPE, uh, which is the Cost Analysis and Program Evaluation um, Office in the Pentagon, much beloved by the services. Um, Dave is, is smiling because, of course, CAPE often challenges uh, the service position. Um, and it's on this question about the Guard and Reserve. And there's no question the Guard has shown itself to be uh, a very useful tool uh, 
uh, because of course it can deploy overseas, but then it has deployed domestically for the pandemic. But the analyst to me says, okay, at the peak, we called up 46,000 guardsmen out of 440,000, that's barely 10%. So what's the argument then for making them larger if we only use 10% of them in this terrible crisis? I'll go first on that if, if that's all right. Imagine the crisis that we're going through now and imagine that instead of it being a virus, it were some sort of cyber attack, right? In that case, you wouldn't have power. We all have power, right? You wouldn't have necessarily have clean water. Our food distribution networks might not be adequate. All those things would be deliberately targeted in a cyber attack, for example, that we're not dealing with, as awful as this crisis is, that we're not dealing with today. In, in some senses, and I hate to say this because I don't want to minimize any of the, the tragic developments that are happening, this is relatively easy compared to what a concerted cyber attack could do to the nation. And so I think that we would be, uh, it, would, it would be wrong to project out from the numbers we needed in this crisis to what we might need in future crises if there were a deliberate attack on the homeland, particularly on the cyber sector. But in addition to that, the, the, so you might need more of them. We might not just need a linear projection of where we are today. But even beyond that, because of the dual functionality that, that we've been talking about, um, you can use them for so many more things, both domestic and internationally, um, that you know you're, you keep a hedge in the reserve component uh, that does you benefit on the domestic missions when there are national crises as well. And again, because budgets are going to be so tight, because end strength is going to have to go down, um, you know, it, it may be that all of the components, the, the, the two components with, that include the active components, the reserves of each of the services and the National Guard, and strength is likely to go down in all of them. Uh, but what uh, uh, Dave and I have written about is, in the past, it's been mostly proportional cuts to both. Um, we think that the cuts, a, a wiser way if budgets are going to be constrained to make those end strength cuts is to be cut a bit less from the reserve component than the active component, again, because of uh, the utility that they have in all sorts of different scenarios. Yeah, I would just add, Billy, I would agree with that. Uh, I would just add that, you know, I'm not sure there's a strong argument to make them larger, but I do think if you have to take down the active component, in particular to save money, there's an argument for whether the active component, let's say, in the Army is structured properly for the world of major power competition out there with as large a number of uh, line infantry or light infantry units it has. If you want to preserve capability, you're probably better off preserving it in the guard and reserve if you have to take it down as opposed to having it leave the force structure entirely because it's a cheaper prospect in the long term to keep those forces in the guard and reserve. And as Nora pointed out, many of them can be used for dual purpose capabilities. Great, let me, uh, uh, let me ask one last question here. There are a couple of other questions coming in. I've got a few more that I'll come back to if I have, a, have time, but um, the question is about the um, opposing tensions on the size of the military and the reserve components. That is, on the one hand, there is this desire to increase their activities for things like pandemics, that they will be more, uh, they will be uh, helpful in future uh, crises. On the other hand, there's a lot of uh, questions being raised about the military's role uh, in dealing with civil disturbances. And border security saying, no, we want less military, uh, not more. So how will this tension play, play out? Desires for more on pandemics and desires for less for civil disturbances in border security. Yeah, let me take a stab at that. First of all, I think it's important to note that the military doesn't vote itself into those missions. You know, the military is there and it has a variety of capabilities. The national leadership, you know, emanating from the White House or in, in the case of the states from the governor's office directs the National Guard or directs the active duty or directs the reserves to do border security or to do you know, any number of other tasks. So I don't think the military is lobbying for more of those kinds of missions by any stretch of the imagination. But their capabilities are so wide ranging and they've shown themselves to be so adept and well trained and are so well resourced and logistically sound that they are a very tempting place for the national government to use. Making the military smaller is not going to change that. 
It just makes the pool smaller from which that next president or that next governor can make his decisions from. So I don't I don't think that's an argument one way or another for the size of the military. Whatever size military is out there, active guard and reserve, you know, the chief executives in the governor's mansions or in the White House can decide to use them for any of these missions, whether the military thinks it's appropriate or not. Okay, let me uh, turn to some of the questions that we've been getting from our audience and then uh, maybe uh, come back to some uh, additional questions. One came up uh, from uh, uh, Dan Gagliano, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, who's over at SICE. And his question is, what do you expect? You know, we're all smiling because three of us uh, teach over there. Um, what do you expect the next uh, national defense strategy to look like? You know, if these changes are implemented, is the next national, strategy, national security strategy really going to focus on great power competition the way this last one has? Or is it going to change in some way to uh, maybe walk back from that? I'll go ahead and, and jump in on that if that's okay. I, I think we're gonna be looking at a new national defense strategy regardless of who wins the presidential election this fall. Um, but I think that the what it contains will differ depending on who uh, who is elected. Um, in both cases, though, I do think the import given to great power competition is going to come down from where it was, uh, because again, as the Americans' conception of national security shifts to a focus on personal security, um, that's going to be reflected uh, to a certain extent in the documents that guide uh, the US military. I think if Trump is reelected in November, you will see more of that continuity and focus on great power competition. Um, although I think it, even then it will still be uh, uh, supplanted with language, particularly in the national security strategy, which is the document that you know, sits above the national defense strategy. I think you'll see even more talk about uh, homeland preparedness and the need to respond to domestic emergencies. But I do think that will be a more important thread in the national defense strategy if Trump is reelected. If uh, the Democratic uh, nominee, presumably at this point, Joe Biden, uh, is, uh, is elected, I think you're going to see uh, even more of a switch uh, in the national defense strategy to reaffirming uh, cooperation with allies and partners, to trying to reduce some of the tensions uh, with our, uh, with particularly with Russia and China by identifying them so publicly uh, as the greatest threats to US national security, and uh, in some cases, even even more of a reframing towards the homeland security role. I don't expect it to disappear. It's clearly a trend that is going to stay with us. It is still a major mission for the US military, uh, but I don't think uh, in any scenario, it's going to become the single dominant talking point, the single guiding point of the entire document the way that it was in 2018. I just wanna say one thing about our allies. Our relationships with allies and partners is just a, a devastatingly low ebb right now. And for us to be able to fulfill the national defense strategy as it's written, or even as I imagine a democratic administration to um, put forward, um, or, or another Trump administration, we have got to mend those relationships. And I, I don't know how we do it, but I look at, um, you know, I, I 100% agree that we are not going to have the troops and even the bases. Adam Smith has made it clear that he's ready to go on a round of, of base cuts. I, I don't know that we're going to have the assets that we have, uh, even in the Pacific. And we have got to rely on our allies. We've got to rely on them to, you know, for their ports. <laughs> We've, but, but for so many resources. And for example, Australia has just been really stepping up and, um, for, for us to have slighted them in the way that, that we have in the last couple of, year, uh, of months over COVID, um, that, that has done some real damage. And our, our national security depends on it. And, and I hope that, and, and I'm sure that um, going forward, I'm, I'm sure it's well recognized by most people in this administration. Um, and I hope that in whatever administration we have uh, in, in 2021. Yeah, I just add to that briefly. I think one, one of the underlying trends that I don't think a number of us in the national security community here, especially in Washington, 
appreciate is the lack of interest that many, many, many Americans have in having a assertive overseas military presence and maintaining bases and maintaining uh, you know, forces that are stationed in Western Europe or stationed in the Middle East or stationed in the Western Pacific. And, and this notion of retrenchment uh, that is not just a political party's outlook, but, but where the American people stand today on overseas engagement. They, they've heard for three and a half years now that the allies have been taking us to the cleaners, taking advantage of us. And there's a lot of Americans that actually don't understand why we are in these places overseas anymore of both parties. And if combining that with the, the lack of interest in being able to spend more money in the military from either party as we go forward and competing demands for scarce federal dollars in the aftermath of the COVID epidemic, you know, with high deficits, this is going to be a tough time to make the argument to the American people that we need to keep doing what we're doing. And so I think either party that comes in office is going to look at that in a different way than they would have even five, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, great. Well, we have a question from John Harper with, with uh, National Defense Magazine. And he asks about the future shape of the DOD medical establishment. Uh, as you probably know, DOD has proposed shrinking the active duty uh, medical establishment, focusing it more on trauma and war fighting and pushing some of the uh, care for dependents and retirees out into the civilian uh, community. Now there's some pushback about that, saying that DOD should pull some of those capabilities uh, back in. Uh, and then so sort of going with that is the question about the DOD's role in developing uh, vaccines and uh, protection against infective diseases, infective infectious diseases, uh, because there is, of course, a Army uh, research establishment which does research on sort of exotic diseases that the military might run into overseas that don't get enough attention in the civilian community because they just aren't um, endemic uh, in the continental United States. So, so two related questions: Do you see a change in the medical establishment and? Do you see any changes in the kind of research that the DOD does? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. I think in both categories, uh, I think the likelihood of the DOD <clears throat> continuing with that initiative it had to outsource a fair a bit of its, particularly um, family member medical care and continental U.S.-based medical care out to the private sector is probably going to be slowed, if not halted. I think the the concerns that the uh, We've seen with you know how debilitating an illness like this has is going to suggest that the, the I think the nation is going to expect to have more of the medical capability in DoD, not less, going forward. So I think that that initiative is probably going to be retarded to a to a certain extent because of COVID nineteen and the perceptions that go with that. On the infectious diseases side, the Army has done that for decades. Has been one of the leaders in that not only in you know, exotic tropical illnesses, but also in bio warfare and, and bio agents, which I think are going to be a new area of focus in the aftermath of this pandemic. If, if this kind of catastrophic economic, you know, disruption can be wreaked by a naturally occurring, you know, biological vector out there, imagine what could be done with one that was designed to create this kind of a problem, especially if you weren't concerned with the people who are carrying it, whether they survived or not. And so whether that's non-state actors or state actors that are actually looking to, you know, disrupt the United States in some severe ways, perhaps in concert with a big, big scale, large scale cyber attack. That's going to be a big worry coming out of the current, you know, crisis because we've never seen anything like this before, and now we realize exactly how debilitating, you know, something that could be engineered to produce these kind of results might be, considering how debilitating even a naturally occurring phenomenon was. Yeah, I'll just uh, add to that. I don't think that as a result of the pandemic, we're going to see a massive change in the way that the medical community is structured in the military. I think actually the way that it's structured worked pretty well for what the demands of the pandemic were. Most of the medical uh, capabilities uh, that can be deployed are in the reserve component. Um, you know, they people who uh, also have civilian jobs in uh, either the health sector or public safety 
safety sector did not were not called up and were able to stay in uh, their local communities. So they were able to navigate that potential problem fairly well. Uh, and the medical capabilities that were deployed, um, you know, fortunately, to a large scale, weren't used. Um, that's a good news story. That doesn't mean they shouldn't have deployed. That means that their extra capacity, uh, you know, in this crisis, uh, you know, ended up not being needed. So I don't expect there, I, I think Dave is probably right about the politics of the uh, initiative to outsource, uh, you know, to the public sector, but I don't think that's going to be driven by an analysis of the requirements. I think that's going to be a perception of uh, people in the military and their families about wanting where they're going to get their care and not wanting that to change. But I don't think there are really any analytic lessons, uh, certainly that I'm aware of, that are going to say the military needs to profoundly reshape its medical structure as a result of the lessons of the pandemic. It's got lots of other issues, uh, but I don't think this is going to be one of them. Okay, we have uh, two questions on a related subject, which is, um, and uh, these come from uh, Joe Williams and DOD, and then uh, um, uh, Brian um, McGarvey, uh, also from DOD, and they both relate to the structure of the reserves. That is, as you see more emphasis being placed on the reserves, perhaps as uh, end strength comes down, do you think that the reserve components are essentially just going to get smaller? Or do you see any major restructuring, major movements of capabilities from the active force into the reserves or the creation of major new capabilities in the reserve components? Yeah, I'll start with that. It's a very interesting question, particularly the latter one, uh, which is does the lessons learned that will emerge out of the COVID-19 epidemic tell us anything about how the reserve component should be perhaps structured a bit differently to deal with these kind of things in the future or to play a role in an even more catastrophic domestic disruption. Again, that could be cyber, it could be something, you know, denial of all space assets, it could be another pandemic. So I think that's that's a worthy question to look at. And it, the, the real question is, is our homeland defense architecture right? Do we have the right structure for protecting the homeland against these kind of problems and how much of that should reside in DOD, how much of it resides elsewhere, and is that balance correct? You know, well, I, I you know, think Nora and I both tend to see cyber as an area where DOD needs to play a bigger role, not a smaller role, because there is simply such a huge gap in our, our defenses there, and there's no one that can really, in the U.S. government or elsewhere, as far as we can see right now, that's actually covering that you know, ubiquitous vulnerability that the nation has that everything rides on. So there may be, it doesn't mean the DOD is now, you know, the cyber king and is responsible for all, all cyber defense, but the, the role DOD has right now is extraordinarily limited and, and probably undercounts what could be done, particularly in the defensive arena. I think there's a lot more that could be played there. I don't personally see too much of a big restructuring of the reserve component coming out of this. There may be some changes in roles and missions overall, though, between perhaps uh, perhaps DHS and DOD that ought to be examined in, in the aftermath of how, how well are we protecting the homeland against the diversity of threats that are out there. Yeah, I would just add on to that. I mean, it, it's a bit of a hard question to answer when we're talking about all of the unknowns, we would be doing that because the roles and missions might be changing. Um, but I, I imagine that, that will be something that is going to be on, on the table when if, if we have a comprehensive look at look at what we're doing. Let me let me expand the aperture on that question a little bit because um, I agree with 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 both of those points. But I think that the if we're right about the coming defense budgets, and if we're right that you know Americans are going to be thinking about national security in a profoundly different way, that is going to exert tremendous pressure on the Department of Defense uh, to restructure how it does everything. I don't think we're necessarily going to see a restructuring of the reserve component or, you know, specific shifts of missions from the active to the reserve as a result of this. But I do think the broader budget crisis, the expanded role that the U.S. government is going to have to play, the political pressures that will put downward pressure on the defense budget, all of those things are going to come together. And, and as I said, my own view is that ultimately the cuts will be deeper than what happened during sequestration. Because remember, full sequestration didn't happen. Congress uh, gave back about half the money. So that, you know, for most years, the sequestration cuts were half of what they originally were in the legislation, for those of you who follow uh, the defense budget in great detail. Um, 
you know, the Department of Defense may not be able to do what it did last time, which was essentially by and large retain the same force structure and salami slice the cuts. It did not make tr dramatic and transformative new changes uh, to really deal with, uh, you know, using more limited resources in a profoundly different way. I think that's going to be different this time because of the scale of the cuts. It's also, you know, almost 10 years later from the 2011 Budget Act that created sequestration and the demands to transform the force, to bring in new technologies into the force, which was happening anyway, regardless of this, that will continue in an even more reduced budget setting. I think that's what's going to cause a lot of very difficult, hard choices to be made. And, and the consequence of some of that may be putting different capabilities in the Guard or Reserve, but not as a direct result of the pandemic, as a result of the broader context uh, that is going to affect the Defense Department as a result. Great, well, our time is almost up, but I'm gonna ask one last question and, just, and then uh, ask each of you to just give a quick response. And the question is this, we're living with two arguably black swan events. Certainly the pandemic was one of those uh, kinds of events came out of nowhere profound effects. And now we are having these civil disturbances, which could uh, have a major effect for many years. A little hard to say at this point. What are the chances that there'd be some international incident, that maybe one of our adversaries takes advantage of this opportunity to do something that drives us to a traditional military response? The North Koreans see this as the opportunity to maybe um, uh, take advantage of uh, a window. So. What are the chances that all of this could get thrown out and we could be talking about a new uh, environment six months from now? Uh, and Melanie, I'm going to give you the first crack at this because you, you haven't had a chance on the last some of the. Oh, no, 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 it's fine. Look, I don't think anyone thought we were going to be anywhere near where we were in March. I don't, th I don't think anybody thought that at Halloween or even at Christmas. Um, and I don't think anybody three weeks ago thought we were going to be seeing the protests, not just in the United States, but around the world with people that want Americans to do better and be better. So I will not rule anything out. And again, it, you know, we have the election coming up. We have a lot of things on the table right now. And one of my concerns is that we aren't going to sit down and have a really hard, comprehensive look because these are real threats, right? As we've all mentioned, this is this is the biggest thing that the biggest threat or the biggest homeland crisis that we've had since World War II, and that that's enormous. Sometimes I wonder if we can even comprehend that, um, especially people that have, you know lived through 9/11 and the financial crisis and so forth. And again, this is not over; it's going to keep continuing. I know that Mark Esper said that we would like to have a, a vaccine by Christmas, but I'm not banking on that. Um, it would be a really really great present, but who knows what's going to happen. So I think um, anything could happen. Uh, I am concerned because I believe that dysfunction in our government is the biggest national security threat that we face, where Congress and the administration are just so reluctant to sit down and go through priorities and talk about what is realistic. And and that deeply concerns me, but I, I'm worried about um, having an honest assessment about everything, making sure that we keep the capabilities that we would need in case of a traditional threat or some sort of a strike, but also being forward looking and anticipating what, what could be around the corner. This wasn't completely unknown. A pandemic was not completely unknown. You know, Sam Brannon and Rachel Hurstman, uh, sorry, Rebecca Hurstman at CSIS did a run through on this and in, it, meant a lot to them and, and people around them, but it, it wasn't taken seriously even after the, the flus that we saw coming out of China. So my hope is that we can sit down and have an honest assessment of this and that, that people can take this seriously before the next crisis comes along, because there, there will be another one. Dave and Nora, we have just a couple of minutes here. If we take one thing away from this crisis, I hope we take away from it the idea that black swan profoundly transformative events are far more likely than we think they are. Not that to say that they're necessarily going to happen, but you know, everything in those first few weeks of the crisis, everything that happened every day, maybe even out every hour was previously inconceivable. To, to most Americans, certainly to me, uh, about you know, the extent to which we would need to shut down the country and everything that happened. Um, 
whether that's going to lead to you know some sort of external challenge against us right now, I don't know. I certainly do think that it is one of the reasons why uh, China crack has been cracking down so hard on Hong Kong is because our attention is elsewhere and we're much less likely to make that an issue. I still believe that our, our conventional deterrent around the world is enough to deter those kinds of threats from happening on top of this. Um, but I know that I'm a lot less confident in what I think uh, is reasonable that might happen or not than I was three months ago, just because of the lessons learned that uh, incomprehensible things can actually happen, even if we can't foresee them or comprehend their full implications. I think I just add that uh, part of this may be based upon whether our adversaries are looking to their long term strategic interests or short term strategic interests. I think the long term strategic interest for all of America's adversaries around the world is a diminished United States, a divided United States. The United States is very uncertain of its role in the world. The last six months have been a godsend if you're a Iran or North Korea or Russia or China in terms of watching what's happened inside the United States and how the United States has responded and in, has been viewed around the world. So we, to have this simply continue on is in the long-term strategic interest of every single American adversary out there. I think there are some short-term risks. Uh, Nora pointed out the Hong Kong issue. I, I don't necessarily think that there's going to be a large armed invasion of another country out there. I think that would be a risky proposition. But th this is also the most unpredictable American administration probably in my lifetime. And so when adversaries look at that, they really don't know whether the U.S. would follow through on its commitments in some domains or not. But I think actually, as I, as I started out, I think that most adversaries are so pleased to see what uh, internal divisions have now erupted in the United States and how much loss of prestige the United States has taken around the world in the last, certainly in the last six months, uh, that that in the, is in their long-term interest to see that simply continue. So I'm, I'm, I don't necessarily see invasions out there, but I do see a uh, continued decline in our trajectory that serves some of our adversaries' interests. Well, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. We appreciate uh, your comments, and I look forward uh, to seeing how these events fold out, uh, unfold, and uh, talking to you more about these uh, in the future.